have been read uh, also online. Prior to moving to Beirut in 2011, she lived and worked in Damascus for three years, where she was editor in chief of an English language daily newspaper. So she's she's quite um, an expert on Syria, and she will be talking to us today about displacement, food, and meat meal farmers, Syrian refugees, and changing food regimes. Yes. Can I? Can you hear me? This is uh, maybe speak up. Yes, a speak up a little yeah. bit. That's good. Okay. Um, so yes, thank you for the introduction. My name is Rima Abdulli, and I'm the managing director of SHUP. It's a non-profit organisation that works towards the development and documentation of citizen voices. Among our current and past projects are the documentation of personal accounts of human rights abuses in Libya, uh, interviews with cohabiting couples in Lebanon and oral histories of Syrian refugees. Uh, each project addresses a different subject matter, but ultimately their commonality is in their use of personal accounts to form narratives. In interviewing Syrian refugees, first here in Lebanon and then in Turkey and Jordan, we aim, through the Syrian Oral Histories Project, to present a narrative of Syrian culture and society prior to 2011, one that is built from the bottom up, uh, is more accurate and reflective of society than the top-down accounts of uh, history previously presented by those in power. That's better. Um, so drawing from this Syrian Oral Histories project and in the context of this conference, I began to informally ask Syrians in Lebanon about their relationship to food and how their meals and meal times had been affected by their displacement. Uh, the people I spoke with include low-income, often no-income, refugees in informal tented camps, low-income urban refugees, middle-income urban refugees, and middle-class professional urban refugees. The discussions were informal and part of a pre-production stage to potential in-depth research into the relationship between displacement, food, and meal times. So it's the result of this pre-production stage in research that I will share with you now. And I'm most grateful for the opportunity to do so and look forward to receiving suggestions and feedback as to how we may develop this further. This photograph I took in 2010 at one of the many family gatherings I enjoyed in Damascus. Uh, the food was as wonderful and warm as the company and we would gather as a family, an extended family of aunts and cousins, at least once a month, as most families did. In fact, many would gather every week on Friday at grandparents' home. Each daughter-in-law or daughter would bring a meal, or oftentimes, if the kitchen was large enough, they would congregate before lunch, and they would cook together. My grandparents had passed away many years earlier, so we would meet at different aunts' houses, but usually the aunt with the largest space, so that the children of tearing up dishes could enjoy a bit of a run around. And I had expected this to be the case at the tent of community camps in Lebanon, that uh, neighboring families would cook together what little they had and, and form almost surrogate families at mealtimes. But this wasn't the case. We can't sit together. We're illegal here now. If we gather, they'll come and investigate. This is what a woman at a tent of camp in Najdalun in the Bahar told me. Public gatherings used to be illegal and monitored in Syria pr prior to 2011, and this mentality of fear continues to permeate many who seek refuge in Lebanon and elsewhere. Fear prevents them from gathering. During the past year, over half the Syrian refugees have, in Lebanon have become illegal. Their visas have not been renewed. So fear of the Lebanese security apparatus prevents them from gathering. Most refugees in tented camps are also indebted to the landowner or the camp manager. As soon as they step foot on the camp, they owe money for the wood and the vinyl that's used to prepare their camps. Uh, many that I spoke to are in debt at least $1,000 to the camp manager. Uh, that's a huge amount of money, particularly when you consider that their legal status makes it very difficult for them to find barely paid work at the moment. So fear of harassment by the camp owner also prevents them from gathering. For some of these refugees in tented community, fear has changed mealtimes from a time of congregation to a time of segregation. They often work in the fields, planting and picking food they cannot afford to eat themselves. Many used to eat off their own land in Syria, but now the poorest of them can only afford bread and yogurt. But even those who can afford a little 
little more are somehow further segregated. We each have different means now, and I can't afford to share what little chicken I have with my neighbor, even if he is my brother. This is what another refugee at a, at a tented community told me. It doesn't sound like the hospitality of Syrians that we're used to hearing about, but hard times have taken their toll on many. I'm hopeful, if not confident, that the war's end will see a return to hospitality. Though we can't know how generous people from different towns or backgrounds will want to be with each other after the war. Though the war narrative draws wedges between Syrian, different Syrian communities now, displacement has in fact brought the cultures of different communities within Syria closer. Syrians who are unfamiliar with the cultures and customs of others from different towns have in the diaspora come to hear accents and taste foods that they were previously unfamiliar with or had little contact with. That cultural exchange began in 2011 with the fine arts, and many Syrian artists uh, from across the country displayed their works uh, to intrigued international communities at various galleries. Donor funding enabled the development and dissemination of performance and film arts that presented the diverse narratives of Syrians in the years that followed. More recently, Syrian foods have taken center stage. While most of the visual arts focus on wartime narratives, food is more universal and less political, enabling Syrians to gather and discuss and exchange moments of their lives away from anger and hardship. It also offers a cultural exchange with foreigners, who prior to the war may not have even known where Syria was, but as is natural when a country is in the headlines year after year, have become more engaged and interested in those people in the news. A cookbook, Soup for Syria, enabled both a look at the country's culinary culture and an opportunity to financially contribute to those in exile. Another cookbook, The Eleven Kitchen by TV chef Muhammad Barfelli, offered a more authentic and gastronomy-focused experience, as did his TV program. Syrians who have migrated to Europe and elsewhere have also shared their culinary skills, both in their homes and at festivals and newly opened restaurants. It wasn't so much a decision as an opportunity. Interest in Syrian cuisine grew and I was presented with an opportunity to work that no one could really object to. So said a middle-aged Syrian woman to me in Beirut who had opened her own catering business. She wouldn't likely have considered this endeavor in her native Aleppo prior to the war, but the clear benefit of an extra income and the increased demand for a service that she had been providing for free every day of her married life led to this housewife becoming a business-owning cook. Before I left London in 2008, I heard that over half the restaurants in, British, in the British capital that were presented as Lebanese were in fact owned by Syrians. They had promoted their cuisine as Lebanese because Lebanese was more well-known. But now, with an increase in Syrian migration and interest in the country, its people and their culture, more and more restaurants have and will likely continue to open. I want to bring peace through my, through my food. So said Syrian chef Dima, who is based in Beirut and is this weekend offering up Syrian street tacos at a food fair at Junkyard in Mount <coughs> Though she's well versed in traditional Syrian re recipes, Dima now more often fuses her food with concepts from other culinary cultures. She does this because she understands the market and people's desire for innovation and novelty. It seemingly works. Foreigners, Lebanese, and Syrians frequent the Syrian dinners she hosts at Macan, a well-known Beirut eatery. A Lebanese patron recently told Dima that she had been enjoying kibbe in the unique way Dima had cooked and presented it to her in her own home. Dima's from Damascus. And she herself began to discover recipes from different areas of Syria after feeling a sense of national solidarity following the widespread suffering that resulted from the war. Her personal and cultural identity expanded because of the war. Whereas the chef made a conscious effort to seek out these recipes from different corners of Syria, other Syrians came across them by virtue of dining together in the diaspora. Emma, didn't know much besides recipes from her native Aleppo and a few from Damascus where she had spent a year before moving to Beirut. She said, I ate a meal at the home of a woman from Deir Ezzur. I wasn't familiar with it before but have cooked it myself several times since. 
Unlike art, which you hang on a wall, or a performance or film, which may be thought-provoking, even thought-changing, but still you only watch it once, food is part of a culture and culinary identity that is very much present in everyday lives. So it lingers. State control, <coughs> didn't it, state control in Syria did not encourage the exchange of ideas and cultures between different communities and areas of the country. On the whole, people didn't travel around the country very much. Now, through displacement and the sharing of local meals, among other cultural exchanges, Syrian cultures are being exchanged among its people, and as a result, Syrians are becoming more Syrian. Not a Lepen or Damascene, but getting to know, sorry, their whole country. Thousands of Syrians, the world over, share stories and recipes through a Facebook group called Foreign Kitchen. It's not really a good translation. It's and outside of war and politics, they can talk about memories and meals and even share advice. Share advice, yes, with those who are in new cities and can't find the ingredients that they're used to. Uh, Dima brings all her ingredients still from Damascus and other parts of Syria when she cooks in Lebanon. Uh, she says it tastes better and it's also cheaper than sourcing locally. That said, many in Syria cannot afford many foods and ingredients that they used to use. And Dina says, the poverty of war results in innovation in recipes. New meals will develop during this time of hunger. It's a sad thing to say, but just as the experience of war influences the cultural history evident in fine art and film, so too does it influence meals. Whether those influences will be permanent or not, we can't know for many years or decades. Similarly, we can't know whether the change in some Syrian men's attitudes towards cooking will prevail. The war and the displacement of many single men that followed forced many of them to cook for themselves. Traditionally, men would be cooked for by their mothers and after marriage to their wives. But the mass displacement of single men changed that. Many young men in Beirut learned to cook, oftentimes being instructed by their mother over the phone. A few I spoke with uh, continue to be the primary cook at home even after they got married. One, Hamad said, I found I enjoyed cooking and I'm better at it than my wife, so why not? He moved to Beirut a single man but soon found and married with his life partner. He too still enjoys bringing in ingredients from Aleppo brought by family members when they visit. So, many factors have influenced and changed gender roles, Muhammad an example, and also the woman from Aleppo who opened her own business, another. The necessity for food sustenance, and for sustenance in general, is one of them. Cooking and gender roles, meal times and security, <coughs> recipes and unity, poverty and culinary innovation. The discussions about food and meal times that I enjoyed with some Syrian refugees in Lebanon was eye-opening in many different ways, and I'm really appreciative to the conference organizers for the impetus for me to, to meet and speak with those people, and for you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for your fascinating talk, Rick. Um, I'd like to open up the floor for discussion.